Justin and Jai are a couple of guys who know they're gonna die, so they're biding time by consuming content and wasting their breath. It's a podcast called Amusing Ourselves to Death. All right, hey everybody, welcome to Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, a podcast where we pass the time before the inevitable collapse of society and our bodies. Uh, I'm Justin. I'm Jai Peck, and I have lots of love to give. I'm Kevin. Cool. It's Kevin Kerner. <laughs> Are you going to, uh, wants to give us your last name? Well, you already have, so <laughs> yeah. cut this out. You've just added him. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, I'm a, a postman, Neil Postman scholar. Okay. Obviously, I was invited on the podcast to discuss the seminal work by Neil Postman, mm-hmm. the monograph Amusing Ourselves to Death, in which he talks about media, and he sort of builds off the framework of Marshall McLuhan, hot and cold media, the medium is the message... Um, so yeah, let's, let's get into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we Ch- decided chapter one, chapter one of the book. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just start there. Um, that was the only way we could get you to come here. So we're actually going to talk about Magnolia instead. So we outright lied to you. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Sorry, Kevin. Do you also like Magnolia? That happens to be one of my favorite films. Oh, thank God. So this is, this works out well. Good. That was a close one. Good. All right. We got plenty of tape in the camera. Jaya was like, don't worry, Kevin doesn't mind being lied to so we'll just lie to him to get him into your house (laughs) kevin's been through enough in his life let's let's not lie to him anymore um before we get started yeah we're doing magnolia this episode the paul thomas anderson film yes about regret and loss cancer game shows things fall down people look up and when it rains it pours and all fathers are terrible yeah pretty much terrible um do you want to do the? Uh, yeah, before the, we get into yeah, the movie, we get into do you the, want to the, just like briefly just? We, we, I've been call, I've been in my. I'm gonna head name and, this segment. I've what been calling it, it "Amusing Aperitifs." Amusing Aperitifs. I like that. I like my alliterations, you know. So I thought right. it was pronounced aperitif. Aperitif. I am an un- uncultured swine. Amusing aperitif. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And okay. really, if you're going to use the French, you should have the indefinite article d apostrophe in front of it, so it'll be the aperitif. The aperitif. Yeah. Amusing aperitif. Aperitif. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you start us off, Jay? Yeah. Uh, well, I've been uh, eagerly anticipating the release of the new HBO show Watchmen, which is uh, a sequel series to the uh, groundbreaking comic book series from the 1980s, also titled Watchmen, which was adapted into a okay movie by Zack Snyder. I think it was the best ago. version we could have gotten, yeah. minus the psychic There's some like, fine parts. There's also some... Just some parts for like, how is this approved by anybody with eyes and ears? But um, the reason I bring this up is um, I was not familiar with the comic. You guys are far too nice to the Zack Snyder Watchmen film. Actually, me and Kevin did see that in theaters uh, when we were in college that, together. That is, oh, really? That okay. is literally the only film that I've regretted not walking out of. Really? Yes. Wow. I want to. Yeah. Tell me. Tell me why. Because I don't. Honestly, when I saw it, I didn't really have any complaints. And then later on, I was like, well, it's pretty long. And I, I didn't really like some of the changes they made. But yeah, I'm interested in hearing what you think about it. <clears throat> I didn't have um, any sort of connection with the comic book or okay. anything. I had read it going into it. And I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. Flips sort of superhero thing on its head. Because at the end of the day, it's like superheroes are dumb. Yeah. And the, like, the evil dude is actually not an evil dude, even though he's killing a bunch of people. Right. With a giant psychic squid. Yeah. Yeah. With a giant psychic squid. It's like squid. the best part. It's, the yeah. ending is the conceit of the piece, and they just like, well, it doesn't really work for us, so they just rewrote it as like... A bomb, right? A bomb that bomb. Dr. Manhattan set off. And yeah, yeah. Oh, Dr. Manhattan it's, it's was pretty, the weapon, right? Yeah, was the, yeah. Anyway, but yeah. But you get to the end of the film, and these superheroes decide they're going to put their capes on and go fight crime again, and it's like you just kind of missed the whole point of this exercise. So thematically, they it seemed like the filmmakers just completely ignored or didn't understand what the graphic novel was actually trying to say but you know i don't nobody throws me 150 million dollars to make <laughs> a comic book movie so yet yet this could change that it could what i mean what's left not much in general, just like, comics in your life or? no no i mean in as far as comic like what oh what hasn't been done yeah. oh there's too much that hasn't been done stuff that shouldn't be done such um, as give me a, what's what's an example of something uh, that we, shouldn't be done. We three has they've been t- it's uh Grant Morrison, I believe. Uh it's oh, about, is that the dog the runaway dog? Yeah, it's like Robocop meets Homeward Bound. <laughs> um and that, no they've been trying to do that for years and I don't think they should ever do it. Um also 
yeah, I don't know. It's just that there's there's just too much stuff out there. There's like a, there's a lot of comics out there they haven't done yet. But as far as like a list superheroes, I don't know. They're getting to the point where it's like they're doing um, the Eternals, and I've never even heard of that. But I'm not also a huge comic guy. Yeah, whenever I hear people like, oh, they're doing the Eternals, they're like, wow, how are they gonna pull that off? It's so crazy town, banana pants. Yeah, but then. They had Guardians of the Galaxy, which was like right. a talking raccoon in a tree. People talking and <laughs> blowing things up. It's like, whatever. Yeah. It worked. Um, How no, much money did Vin Diesel get paid to say three lines a few thousand times? Or three words, excuse me. I read that how much he got paid. I don't remember what it was. I'm going to look it up. I want to know how much per word mm-hmm. in the finished film that would be. Well, the reason I bring a Watchmen is... Um, yeah, back to your point. Sorry. Really, the point I had was... I was not aware of the comic until I was seeing like the trailers, which had a decent first theatrical trailer for the movie. Had that Smashing Pumpkin song in it, so they, there was a lot of uh, anticipation for the film to come out. So me being a, a completist who has to have as much context as possible, I decided to read the comic book before I saw the film. So now, but now I'm more looking forward to the show based on the comic book, but not really caring about the movie, which was what I was originally looking forward to. So now I'm just kind of like wondering like. <sighs> My relationship with material and what starts it and is the snake eating its tail if I'm just reading things to watch things or watching things to read things. Do you know what I mean? I I sort of know what you mean. I was talking with you actually the other day about the idea of what excites you about a franchise and like looking at fandom sort of through a few different lenses and the one is I don't understand when Disney is doing an obvious cash grab like why make a live action quote unquote Lion King or why right, right. why do Beauty and the Beast again why do any of these films that are like you know pretty perfect examples of storytelling and it's sort of a cynical response it's they're introducing this to the next generation mm-hmm. and so parents who already have the connection take their kids and they get indoctrinated and so that's my response to it. However, on the flip side, you know, Blade Runner 2049 comes out and I'm like first in line to buy tickets to that. But I'm like, I know I've already swallowed the Kool-Aid on that. That's also not a multi-billion dollar transnational industry. That's somebody giving Denny Villeneuve 200 million to make an art film. Everybody agreeing it's just a little too long. Same thing with, with Dune, to even go back to Villeneuve. It's like, it's a good book. The 1984 film is just something. <laughs> Still haven't seen it yet. It exists. It exists. Mm-hmm. We'll say that. Yeah. But then with uh, Villeneuve getting a chance to do his own version, it's again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in line to buy tickets to that. Mm-hmm. So what well, actually I'll probably be in line to buy tickets and then I'll say, Kevin, we're going to the Thursday night show. Do you want to go? And I'll get like a long text. Like, I suppose. And then <laughs> but you also say you're saying these things getting in line to get tickets, whereas nobody gets in line to get tickets anymore. Yeah, they kind of they just send you the concession stand now. Like it's they, a, they don't even have the box. I don't even something. go there. I just buy them on my phone, and then I have a seat. And it's mm-hmm. over. It's a, a figure of speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's know. just it's over. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, trying to generate tension. Yeah, but Oof. so anyway, yeah. uh, I, I agree. With you, I mean, though, because sometimes I feel overly cynical, where I'm like, "Fuck, why is this happening?" But then I have to realize all the time that this isn't for me, mm-hmm. and I shouldn't get so upset about it. Yeah, <laughs> like I don't really. I liked The Lion King when I was a kid. I could recite the entire script almost by memory, the whole movie. I loved it so much. And it's like, but also, like, I was eight. And like now it's like, well, what? Did, this doesn't affect my life in any way. So, right. but Do it's you think also. They, they're remaking it like in live action. They, re, they do all these live action remakes for Disney because, like, is there this idea that, like, oh, a cartoon is for kids and, like, the people, the kids who grew up with this are adults now. So, like, they want to see it. They introduce their kids to it, but like they can't. Sh- they don't want to show their kids a cartoon because that they think it's kid stuff. That's no, not. It's effective. It has nothing to do with anybody. I think it's just yeah. like you said. It's like a cash grab. They're just doing it again. Mm-hmm. It's been long enough, so let's do it again. And even your your point's good. That no, this isn't for me. But so I don't have to right like, hate on it. However, the thing that I come back to is there's resources to get things made, and there's artists putting a lot of man hours into these things. And, True and. The, the resources and all that time and energy being spent on this, why why can't that be... Why can't you take a risk on 40 different stories instead right. of one $200 million story? Yeah, exactly. No, I agree with you. Yeah, the money's made page. up. I mean, we were like, oh, this costs too much. Like, it does it. You know, we have the same amount of resources on this planet than we ever that we ever have. We'll probably get more eventually, but money's just a lie we tell ourselves. I'm saying down with money and let's, okay. let's quit our jobs okay. and do this full time. All right. Well, something's got to stick. Something's got to stick. 
Uh, anyway, that's Watchmen. I've been I've, I, I I had a week where I reread like the comic. To thank our Patreon sponsors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this could ta- this discussion will be continued exclusively on Patreon. If you want to subscribe, uh, no, just, just kidding. I am going to set something up so we can put like bonus stuff on there. Great. So sweet. So yeah. that was I had a week of just reading rereading Watchmen, watching the movie, getting hyped, hyped for the the, the HBO series, which is getting some pretty phenomenal write ups. Apparently, the score just totally slaps. Which is a phrase that I don't use that often. I, it's a little out of character for you. Yeah. I'm a little taken back. Yeah, he used it for the first time Friday night around me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we're doing that now? Okay. It's like, I got something I want to test out. I mean, I've already just, <laughs> yeah. I've used all my adjectives up like over the last, yeah. course of the last 32 years. I'm just I'm looking for new ones. I get it. I so. wore Crocs for a week mm-hmm. and it didn't work. But I, I think tried. S- yeah. Is slaps an adjective? Griffin Newman uses it on Blank Check. He's like, oh, it slaps. That's the first time I've heard it. He said Pee-wee's Big Adventure fucking slaps. And I was like, what is that? (laughs) Just the context is weird there, too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. As long as nobody says crushed anymore. I don't want to say crushed. I want to say it's good. (laughs) I'm so sick of crushed. I'm so out of it. I've heard slaps, at least, but Mm -hmm. crushed? I think crushed is like over now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It moves too fast. That's played out. I think we can agree it's all totally trill. What? Trill? (laughs) Oh, boy. You you you're losing us. Man. <laughs> yeah. So that was my week of okay. my week of Watchmen. So um, did you have anything that you're into right now? Depression. Okay, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, what network is that on? Oh, it's uh, <laughs> sorry, I meant the leftovers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, I'm not really into anything right now. I've just been picking through my friends' voodoo and watching terrible movies at two in the morning. So Men in Black International recently watched Oof. that. Is that the newest one? Yes. Okay. And it is instantly forgettable. <laughs> yeah. It, the trailer, I was like, really? I, I don't know. It just didn't look like visually good at all. Like, I don't know. It just looked like they showed the whole thing in the trailer. I don't know. I just remember I loved that movie when it came out. And it was like. And the original is like an example one, of I mean. like, you can do a great movie at 90 minutes long. That movie yeah. is a tight hour and a half. Yeah. And now every blockbuster has to be, be like at least two hours, 215, 220. And then for some reason last night. I decided I was going to put on Thor Ragnarok because, you know, and then five Cause minutes. Because you know why. Because, you know. <laughs> oh, you we know. all know. Yeah, we, I know. And five minutes in, I'm like, this movie's too long. I'm never going to finish it. So I stopped it and I poked around my friend's voodoo account and I put on Endgame. Oh, okay. Did not finish that movie either. Right. I'll put on a shorter movie. Yes. Endgame. Put on a three-hour movie. <laughs> Oof. Which... Looks back down to Leftovers and the Depression, because that first, those first 30 minutes of Endgame, they're very just kind of people moping around, moping around crying. And oh, yeah. Going to support it's like an groups. hour, though. Yeah. Like, they don't it's... actually start the whole time heist thing mm-hmm. until you're like 90 minutes into that thing. Yeah, yeah. Dustin, what about you? Any, uh... I got the Wawa has a new bagel sandwich. It's like a turkey egg white thing. Um, bagel sandwich. Got that today. Well, I, didn't, I didn't think we could open this up behind the media. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I started playing Control, the video yes. game. Jaya lent me that last. Yes. So I started playing that last night. And as a big Twin Peaks fan, Twin Peaks fan, mm-hmm. um, I love it already. It's great. Uh, I don't care about any of the action stuff. I oh, just not care at all. about the little documents that you find, which are hilarious. That's a, so I'll just I just keep reading everything I find and I'm ignoring the narrative. Yeah, read everything. That, that's, <laughs> that's my one complaint. I'm I'm, I'm talking lately because you haven't finished yet. But like, yeah, I want to do an episode there's, on. There's it, no but. like difficulty. So like, it's there are parts where it's like this is this is getting too hard and I don't want to work this hard just to kind of get like the fun narrative components of it that I'm enjoying. And that's just where I'm just like yelling at my hands, like just be better. And then I'm not. <laughs> yeah, because we just I don't want to get over this boring action yeah, part. Like, so I can okay, get to more I know stuff. Gotta, yeah, you have to have a boss fight. I get it, but like, can't I just hit him twice or three times and then he's dead? I, you know, when it's just like he's just relentless and yeah, uh, it's just not fun anymore. And then it's just like I just and then I start questioning why am I playing games to begin with? Do I actually enjoy the gameplay or do I just enjoy the gameplay that? Um, support the, the narrative that the gameplay that supports the narrative. So why don't I just read a book or something? You ever play any like the heavy rain, heavy rain or heavy rain, yes? Yeah, okay. I played Sean? all of their games. Sean, Sean, um, where you at? <laughs> I saw a really good video of somebody doing a cosplay at a comic con of uh, Sean, and it was just literally like he had a, like a little his son or whatever holding a red balloon in the crowd, and then just the guy was just doing that for the whole time. <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah, I, I played um, that with a buddy called, like when it came out for like a week straight, and just. The the, the, the the tension that with that that game got you were like you had to like drive backwards through traffic and then yeah. you had to like do you chop off your thumb uh, or of course to you get do. to find your child of course you would yeah and then there's some pretty I think cool I, twists in it I think I made I would make the opposite decision mm-hmm. I don't think I would I oh, don't think you'd do it no. 
never had a child, so yeah. I really can't speak to mm-hmm. that. But, yeah, me neither. Uh, you could have another one if you lose one. So I, I, I think it was. Point. To be honest, it wasn't even his thumb. It was like his pinky. Yeah. It was still just like that, that's that's a big choice. It was also a hacksaw. Yeah, which is like hmm. there was a rumor like after that game came out that David Milch was gonna like adapt the game into a movie, which was the greatest thing I ever read. Yeah, to this day, hilarious. But uh, sadly, has not. Is that an Onion out. article? <laughs> is, is that a what? Is that an Onion article? I can't no, tell the no, difference it, anymore. It's real. Is it real? I don't know. Well, cool. Keep playing Control. We, I, I, I will I, be. I, I it's it's fun times. Good fun things to say about it. I'm gonna do a Twin Peaks repo, rewatch now though, and I, I they actually just bought the rights to Alan Wake. So I think they're going to do a remastered Alan Wake on PS4 and I'm going to freak out if they do that. I'm going to buy it immediately. Mm-hmm. I love that well, game. Well, all I can say is keep reading those documents you find in uh, filing cabinets in the offices of the Federal Bureau of Control. Oh, I'm going to keep reading Keep them. reading them. It's yeah. the best part of the game that so far. The best part of the game. I'm completely lost. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, uh, yeah. Uh, let's Speaking of completely lost, uh, Magnolia. Magnolia. Um, I just want to say I made the mistake of drinking almost a gallon of water before watching this movie, so I had to pause it several times. <laughs> um, and then uh, as I paused it, I was like, oh my God, it's only been an hour? Yeah. <laughs> I'm already emotionally exhausted. Uh, but yeah, I haven't seen this since college which is like maybe 2004. Mm. And I clearly wasn't ready for it then. I remember the opening, but that's all I remember. And I remember Tom Cruise and Philip Seymour Hoffman crying. Those are the only memories I had of this movie, but it blew me away. It like leveled me yesterday and put me in a mood. How did you, uh, I'll pose this to both of you. How, how did you come across this movie? What was your personal connection to it? Like what made you rent it or see it in theaters? Anyways, no one saw it in theaters here, I don't no. think. No, me neither. Rented I would have been 12 when this came Same. out. So. Oh, okay. I encountered it, um, it was like the summer before I left for college, so I was probably 17 or 18, and uh, my friend was hanging out at my house the one night, and he's like, yo, you should check this movie out. Just like, a bunch of 17-year-olds like, hey, check this movie out, Magnolia. And I'm like, this is cool. And then frogs fell from the sky. <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big spoiler. Yeah. But I, I just think it's kind of odd that like, a fellow, like, fellow like teenager was like hey check this thing out and i as a fellow teenager was like oh yeah this is like like i connect with this which is very odd to think because none of those storylines even remotely were like resonant with me but the thing as a whole was resonant with me i think also it's kind of odd that people from my generation like in middle school and high school office space became a cult classic too which Mm -hmm. which was like why does this comedy about white collar malaise resonate with a bunch of 13 and 14 year olds what is the connection there yeah that's interesting because i saw that movie i rented that and i rented office space jalen silent or no not jalen silent bob um dogma and Evil Dead 2, I think, in the same weekend. <laughs> that was a great weekend. But I loved Office Space. I didn't, yeah, but I had, I, I worked at a grocery store at that point. I think I was like 16. So it's like, yeah, that's weird how it like, I don't know, maybe just because they cursed a lot and it was just funny. I don't know. That was the epitome of 90s movies were just like the ultimate question for the characters was, am I happy enough? Yeah. <laughs> but then like 9-11 happened and now it's just, things got real. I'm still not happy enough, even though 9-11 <laughs> know, right? happened. The question is still there, but... Yeah. But now um, it has to be like there's like a all the the, the color pad, palette has been darkened, so mm-hmm. you know it's serious. How did you guys encounter this film? I feel like the girl I was dating at the time maybe tried to show it to me. I don't know. I feel like I saw it around the same time as I saw like the typical college movies like Fight Club, Boondock Saints, mm-hmm. like all those movies were around the same. I don't know where it's like this movie's gonna blow your mind. You know what I mean? Uh, but I remember watching the intro and it like really sucked me in. And then once it because I, I love like I don't know all the stuff about coincidence or and everything like that. I remember that intrigued me, but then I don't know if it was so long ago that I don't remember if I even finished it, but I remember the frogs vividly. So yeah, I don't I remember, remember how I stumbled upon it at all. I remember the intro and the frogs from my yeah. first viewing experience. Cause the intro is so cool. Cause it's like, like the, the falling body and him getting shot by the shotgun. And it was like, and I was like, is this the whole movie? And then it got into a more like narrative thing. And I was, I don't know. It just that part, those parts I didn't remember. It's also a really concise way, well, concise in the 15 minute, 20 minute introduction. But he he knows that he's got to do some heavy lifting in order to introduce you to all these threads and all these characters. And he does it in a really slick way to, to put these people in, in your brain, you know. And there's none of these characters 
you don't get confused between any of these kids, even though some of them are even named the same. You got oh yeah, you got two Jims. I think mm-hmm. Jaya pointed out Jim mm-hmm. Gator today. and Jim Curry. Yep. What about you? What about you, Jaya? Oh well, I have a kind of a roundabout history of this movie. Uh, when I was probably ten or eleven, me and my friends stumbled upon Boogie Nights on HBO late at night, just hanging out. Of course, being the young man we were, we were very enamored by Heather Graham and Julianne Moore's a uh, couple of their select scenes in that film. So it was just one of those movies that, like, I think we taped off HBO, and we just, like, shared, like, a VHS copy of it, like, between us, just, you know, every now and then. Uh, but then it was years later when I signed up for Netflix, like, the, the DVD uh, mailing service, and I started kind of going through a whole big uh, film phase. And I remember, rent- I, you know, at this point, I rented Boogie Nights for the story and the acting and the production design, the filmmaking. The articles. Yeah, the articles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that's when I became more aware of the director who I looked into it. Oh, who's this Paul Thomas Anderson guy? I think uh, Punch Drunk Love was coming out around that time. But so I was going through his filmography and I think I rented Heart Eight as well as, um, sorry, Sydney and uh, Magnolia. So that's uh, my first exposure to Magnolia. Now that you've said Punch Drunk Love, I think that was the first pta movie i saw and maybe i rented magnolia because i yeah realized it was the same guy mm-hmm. but yeah i love punch drunk love yeah that was about was, two, 2002 so. i think also the two of you are really getting at something here for me which is paul thomas anderson was probably the first name of a director that i really like knew and like could actually like in my early movie watching phases like oh i understand that he has a style that he's like using with boogie nights and with magnolia and even with punch drunk it's a little bit more uh refined um but you know you i mean you know who spielberg is you know who george lucas is but you can't really think you know you're just sort of swallowing that at an early age but for me pt anderson was like the first director's name i like knew and sort of identified yeah and you're just like wow he does a lot of stuff i'm gonna look at his other stuff yeah i I think i had that same memory where i was like i love paul thomas anderson i just like what he's i like what he's all about i'm subscribed to his magazine yeah what's this guy up what is he oh my god he has other things yeah Yeah. no that's i I think i had the same thought Uh, i'm trying to think of any other director that uh, maybe wes anderson around the same time where i was just like it 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 took me a while to get into wes anderson i thought royal tenenbaums was dumb as shit the first time i saw it and then i rewatched it years later and i was like i'm an idiot um but um i feel like there will be blood is like for some reason stands out as being different from his other movies i don't know i feel like that was the first sort of not i don't want to say grown up but it feels like he's struggling with different sort of thematic and stylistic questions yeah he's hinted at it in punch drunk when he's doing the sort of interstitial i forget what he calls them uh, there's a stylistic shift where like the colors the abstract mm. colors appear on the screen and, and is the music yeah. yeah and he's sort of playing around with a different you know formal nar- formal language for filmmaking and then there will be blood comes and it's sort of He's not relying on his old tricks like the long takes and the floating cameras. I mean, they're still in there, but he he's using them in a, in a different way, and it feels more refined. It feels like a, an evolution from the, the style previously, um, which is even more pronounced once you get to the master, mm-hmm. which is, like, to me, that's that film was amazing. Yeah, I have that on Blu-ray. I bought it because I uh, when I rented it, it was it was long. I think I started it too late at night, and so I had to go to bed, and then I finished it in the morning. But I have yet to sit down and just watch the whole thing in one sitting. Mm-hmm. So I've been planning on doing that for a while. But that was that I really like that. Affects your viewing experience when you have to bring yes. the movie up in like two days or a morning. And yeah, I don't. It's not yeah. ideal. I don't yeah. like doing that. I mean, you know, it happens logistical reasons. But um, yeah. So how do we want to do this? We want to get into like. I mean, we, we brought the script. The or reading the whole bit. script. Or <laughs> I, I had something about the prologue I wanted yeah. to bring up. The prologue uh, posits that like here's like three like basically like god playing tricks on humanity and you know here's like these crazy coincidences that happened according to like the newspaper articles uh, these strange things these things strange happen, happen all, all the right. time all the time things happen all the time who's that narrator ricky j okay all right r.i.p r.i.p ricky j. oh he's r.i.p oh yeah pretty well pretty recently within the past year I think. oh okay um and 
he's best known for uh, he's a sleight of hand or was a sleight of hand magician. Interesting. Um, the New Yorker did a profile on him. That's like fascinating reading just who this guy was what he did and the more you learn about him the more you're like this guy was actually the um the character and the prestige that pretended to walk around with like in order because he was always performing yeah and ricky J, while he didn't affect like a physical ailment the more you learn about this man, the more he's like so cultivated everything that he had done to be this like sleight of hand masterpiece that it was always a performance. He, yeah. he has my favorite moment in the behind the scenes documentary of this film uh, where they're on set of the What Do Kids Know uh, game show. <laughs> And Paul's just like overly like sorry I don't yeah PTA is like kind of going to block and he's talking to Ricky J and then it's like uh, then this happens this happens and and then we land on you and Ricky J says uh, and do I say anything and then PTA says like you can say whatever you want and Ricky J says and so I have so I have and you can't stop me <laughs> and it's the way the way he said it is is very uh, gut busting hilarity yeah so but and the question the, what I wanted to ask say my point about the prologue is it sets up this. The positive this, this these things happen all the time these strange coincidences does the movie itself live up to those first three uh like pieces of evidence in the prologue i think so because i was thinking about the stanley character the kid mm-hmm. and i was tr- he seems to be obsessed with that stuff where he's like reading all those books about like um just like re- like the coincidence stuff, yeah. you know what I mean, and like about like towards the end, he's reading books about kid geniuses and being like, oh, there's more people like me, and it's almost like he's special, but he doesn't want to be, and he's like, oh no, I'm not special. This has happened before, and that seems to be the theme. I feel like yeah. it holds up in a way. Like, I mean, I'm just thinking like we have like piece. guy gets murdered uh, outside Greenberry Hill Pharmacy by Greenberry and Hill, Hill. Mm-hmm. the scuba diver slash Elder car Darien. dealer. Get scooped up by this yeah. firefighter His who true passion beat him was up for the lake. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And then Stanley, well, it's not it's not Stanley. Um, the guy jumps off the roof in the prologue. Yeah, uh, he gets shot by his mother with a shotgun that he himself loaded. Hoping he, they he would, would have died. He would have saved yeah. himself if he wasn't dead from the, the bullet wound. I'm saying those three instances of like God, like ha ha, look look what I did. Does that is there a moment in Magnolia, the actual film, that kind of like beats all of those? Um. I think, I think so with the frogs. With the frogs, so the because the Exodus eight two thing, mm-hmm. uh, just the uh, which I looked it up. It was like what? What is that passage? It's like I will smite them, and if they don't do this, I will smite their borders. Yeah, with frogs yeah. Or if something. you don't release them okay. or whatever, yeah. I feel like um, because it happens at the moment where uh, like uh, what is it, Donnie, uh, the the quiz kid. He's trying to return the money. Smith. He's trying to turn the money, and then John C. Riley's driving, and you think he's just going to be like, all right. I don't know. It's like the moment he does the U-turn is immediately when the frogs happen, and it's what like almost doing, that's dummy? the last straw. It's like, let, leave these kids alone. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's the whole theme of the movie is leave okay. the kids alone, and then it builds up to this thing, and then the frogs. I don't know. I'm just asking, like, would this movie work without the prologue? I think, oh. I think it would. I think so. I think that the prologue is there for foreshadowing, too, because when it picks up the scuba diver, it's almost like what happened with the frogs is it... Because that's a natural oh, phenomenon. I didn't think about that. Is where, like, I don't know the exact science, but I looked it up, I think, the first time I saw this movie, where that will suck. It'll, like... It's a specific type of weather pattern. Yeah. It will suck up, like, the tadpoles or whatever into the atmosphere or the frogs and then, like, deposit them. Gotcha. So, it is it is a real world thing. Mm-hmm. I, think, um, I think the film works without it, but I think it works a lot better with it. Yeah. Just for establishing the tone of the film, the style that's going to be utilized. Um, Cause he's PT Anderson's even easing you into that too. Cause he's brings you with the sort of um, Academy framing 133 aspect ratio mm-hmm. and the black and white. But even with that, he's using his sophisticated camera techniques. So he's giving, mixing the old with the new and sort of saying, this is the language I'm going to use. And mm-hmm. then we open up into full color. So mm-hmm. he's even easing us into the things that he's going to be doing behind the camera as well in the yeah. film. He loves his push-ins, you know, he just like push-ins on, on moments. On this, you know, yeah, almost every cameras. character is introduced through a television. Yeah. Like, or the, he's just like, he's just like moving through hallways and finding people and, you know, it's it's almost too much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I agree with you because if that if that prologue wasn't there and we immediately went into that incredibly manic introduction to all those characters, I feel like I it would have been too much right away. Mm-hmm. I feel like I needed something to like ground me 
before we went into that, where I was like, oh, okay, he's setting up a theme here. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. He's, yeah, then, he's setting up a theme. The he's setting up a style. And now I can start like narratively paying attention. Yes. As Now that I sort of have gotten this language in my head of, of how I'm supposed to read this. Right. Yeah, so I would say I, 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 that's one of my favorite parts of the movie is the prologue. <laughs> I do love that like, one, uh, that great bit of uh, sound, uh, bit of sound, where like after Delman Darion's getting beat up in the casino, and there's like that freeze frame, but like when the freeze frame is on the characters, like there's like that gas, like the car brake sound sound effect. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, no. it just like it's like something like slightly off kilter was going on here, and he has like these like really, like kind of really bizarre sound effects. He kind of laces in there uh, and other portions as well. What's your favorite storyline, and who's your favorite character in this? Oh, that's so hard. Or what's what's the thing that resonates? What's like the one story in it that resonates the most with you? I would say probably uh, Stanley's. Stanley. Yeah, just because I feel a very personal connection with that character, just being like, no, you're gonna do it all. You're gonna do it all, and just just taking it and being like, okay, I'll just do what everybody else wants me to do. This is what I'm supposed to do, and then the moment I don't, the moment I just want to just go to the bathroom. Right. I can't even do that. I have to piss my pants and then stand up in front of everybody. And then even at the end when he's like, you can't be mean to me anymore. And just go to bed. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you expect he's going to have this moment. And it's like, no, no, you don't even get that. It's going to be the same. Looking yeah. back on that sequence, it kind of remi- it makes me think they're like Cynthia, like the handler of the kids. She's just kind of bad at her job. And she didn't say, all right, we're going to go up on stage. Anybody have to use the bathroom before we go on stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen a film before, Jaya? I, I, the, I've seen a few. That's but. If that's not if that's in there, there's yeah. no drama? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's like my dad never goes to see films. Mm. But I convinced him to go see Inside Lewin Davis because it's the folk scene. Oh, yeah. And my dad grew up like during that era. He really enjoyed that music. And so this is like the second time he's been to the theater since the '60s. Really? Wow. Something like that. And he comes home, and I'm like, "So, Dad, what'd you think about it?" And he's like, "Well, when he played the best song in the movie, the agent, the agent didn't think it was very good." I'm like, "Okay, you've ne- you just <laughs> you haven't seen a film like <laughs> you haven't seen a film in 50 years, and you've never seen a Coen Brothers film before." I don't know. There was some conflict I wasn't comfortable with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was, yeah, they all just get along. They gotta yeah. blow things up and have some fights. He didn't sign the paper where, like, where he got royalties. He took the money up front, and he should have done the royalties. Eh, eh, forget. Why this can't movie. people be as logical <laughs> as I am? Yeah, because then there's no drama. Right. Mm. And also, the kids aren't human beings. They're just props right. to these people. So it makes it makes sense to just like now, fuck, like whatever. Um, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your favorite uh, narrative? You've seen it more, probably more times than either. I don't know. I, I really like uh, Officer Jim. Uh, it's really good. Um, just the way that he's introduced with the scene with Marcy and then talking to himself. Mm-hmm. Um, As if he's on cops. Yeah. And then you realize he's like, it's really driven home that he's alone. Like, he's not a loner, but he is alone. Um, and his... The relationship with Claudia, which is obviously problematic in a number of ways, but mm-hmm. that uh, really resonates with me too. Even though it's like this idea of like she's broken and he can fix her, but you know that sort of issue aside, I, it's some of it's really sweet. But yeah, I agree. I, I felt for him. I don't know if I. It makes me wonder if I'd like this character if it wasn't played by John C. Riley because I already no. love him. Yeah, that that definitely helps. Yeah, um, because the moment where he is like clearly flirting with her and then just coming in, and it's like, uh, you, uh, you aren't a good cop. Like, you know what I mean? It's like you shouldn't be doing this. That's one of my big questions: Is Jim Karen a good cop? Yeah, because he clearly like he. he does he not know that she's on drugs? Like the way that she's, you know, they're interacting is like she's just very yeah. fidgety and agitated, and like obviously he's like been in situations where people have been on substances, and like he doesn't recognize an addict or like someone on drugs when. Yeah, it's clouding his, his judgment. So, yeah, I think he's. A, yeah. I think he's not a bad person, but he's also not a good cop. Mm. I, I think th- that's a that's a good way to parse it out because he's a little too judgmental. Um and uh, but I think he he's well intentioned. But he's also not judgmental. True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's like. He'll let it go. The law is the law. Damned yeah. If I'll break it. <laughs> right, right. It's not my. Yeah, it's, it's not my duty. Sometimes people need to be forgiven, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you need to go to prison. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to make that decision. Uh, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I don't necessarily... Um, there's a lot less motion in the Earl Partridge story, but Phil Hoffman, I mean, he's he's basically standing in a room or sitting in a room for the entirety of that story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what he's doing is a lot quieter and it's not as showy as what pretty much all the other characters are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just reacting the whole time. He's like exactly. a, he's like a real hospice nurse was just like absorbing all of this grief mm-hmm. and all of this emotion for everybody else and just taking it on and then just dealing with it <laughs> somehow <laughs> crushing. <laughs> Except for the moment where he stands up and he's like, Oh, it's raining frogs. <laughs> it's like yeah. the moment on his face when he, you, you don't even see what he's seeing. It's, it's just tight on his face and just, I don't know what it washes over him. What's happening is the, one of the greatest he things. He just has to verbalize it. Like, Holy oh, there's, shit. There's frogs falling out of the sky. Yeah. Just the, oh, 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 like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. I like, uh, what's his name? Jim, Jim, officer Jim. Officer Jim Curring. Curring. Yeah, I love the end with when they're at the dinner and he just breaks down. And he's like, "Yeah, nobody respects me. I'm yeah. a joke." I lost my gun today. Oh god. What? I, I lost my gun today. That's. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm trying. Are to... you doing the movie? <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing Claudia's part. Yeah. No, it's yeah. good that you said that. Mm. <laughs> I, I love his like his monologues of like him pretending he's God talking to himself. Like, all right, Jim, you know, I put this woman in front of you today. I know you're not going to mess it up. And then that comes like, a, like they, they kind of hit that second beat where like when he's like, uh, I wrote it down. What he, when, he, I, when he lost his gun, he's, he's in the rain. And he's just like, yeah. he, he's like, no, he's not saying that he's like, he's like, a, he's like a fucking idiot, but he's just kind of really just demeaning himself. And He's not but, gone completely Phil Hoffman. No, no. Uh, fucking idiot. I love it. What does she say to him? It's like, now that you've met me... Would you object to never seeing me again? Which I think is in... Was it uh, Amy, Amy Mann, Mann lyric? Or, it's like they're playing her records through like the whole movie. It's, it's either Amy Mann or it's Fiona Apple. It's one I, of the two. Right? Yeah, it's I'm one of the sure two. i Amy Mann. Because I know Fiona Apple is... She's like the uncredited voice on the phone. Yeah. Uh, when he first calls. And then she also every painting in the movie is like hers. Were, he, were her and PTA like dating or they something? Were, they were dating. Okay. Yeah, they were thinking. There's some great right. stuff on the like this... Have you guys watched the behind the scenes documentary? No, been, I want to. Been yeah, more than a... it's very fresh in my mind. It's a great bit towards the end where PTA is deep in post production hell. Well, he, not hell, but he's he's having a hard time. Like I think just editing the movie, and he has like Fiona Apple just pr- pretend to be like one of his like as he's pretending her that she is Magnolia, like but like Magnolia is like one of his children, and it's just like all right, and she's just kind of dancing, and he just keeps braiding her and yelling at her like, why can't he be like more like Boogie Nights? You know, Boogie Nights wasn't this long. Boogie Nights people love Boogie Nights. You know, people. <laughs> You know, they say that, that, that they love the Jason Robards monologue, but they don't. You know, there's a line to your face, and it's it's it really should be in the movie. <laughs> but, so um, that's interesting that he had so... I mean, it's I guess that happens to anybody who's cutting a film that yeah. they just spent 90 days shooting. But this film is edited in the script. Like, he's already cut this in the script. Mm-hmm. And when you read the script, it's very clear because there's camera directions in there and whip pans and... Everything he's doing. There's even um. So why did that? Why did that happen? Why do you think he actually ran into trouble editing it if it was already cut in the script? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know enough about it because I I, I read a part of the trivia for this movie that it was like at the time it was like no this is the my favorite thing that I've ever done. So it's like some at some point he reconciled everything and he's like oh no, mm-hmm. I do like this but. There is a whole know. subplot he cut out of uh, with Dixon and the worm. There's a, yeah, because we never yeah. get any resolution with the yeah. worm. Because you see, no. when the kids are all in that one room together, and then that person in the coat, who Jim initially chases, um, comes in and then takes the kid somewhere, and you think that that's going to resolve, and then you get nothing. Right? Even in the very first teaser of the film, like Dixon is like set up to be a major character. He's one of the like the everyone introduces himself in the teaser. I'm Frank T.J. Mackey. I'm Stanley Specter. I'm Dixon. But then. You'll see on the documentary, like, they were having trouble filming that sequence. Basically, there's a whole sequence that they cut out of the movie. Where, sorry, I'm hitting the table. <laughs> or uh, after Stanley uh, runs out of the, the studio, he goes to the library. After the library, he goes to a diner, and he's hanging out, and he sees the worm sitting at another booth. And the worm, like, basically, like, makes himself cry just to kind of gain some sympathy. And they end up having, like a, like, a coffee together. And, like, the worm's, like, saying, oh, yeah, my dad, the guy who's found dead in Marcy's closet in the beginning of the movie, was always beating on me if I don't bring money home for selling these candy bars. Can you help me out? And 
but then right at the moment when the frogs start falling, Dick, uh, the worms, uh, you know, he kind of like has a change of heart. But that's when Dixon comes in with like the gun, like, Dad, did he get his money? Did he get his money? And he pulls the gun out, and then his father, Dixon's father is the worm. It's a little complicated. Wait, who's Dixon again? Is it the Dixon's little kid? The young kid. kid. Who yeah. raps, right? Yeah. And the worm oh. is Orlando Jones. Right. Oh, okay. Make seven up yours. Oh. See, I'm, I'm, yeah, I was having trouble following because... Um, yeah, it, it was a really like... It, I remember reading it even in the script and like it was like, this doesn't really have a place. It, it's, I think by that point in the movie, people have forgotten about the worm mm-hmm. anyway. So it's like... And then Jim also isn't even... It's not like he's hunting him down. He's like on a date now. Right, right. <laughs> it's he, like he's hanging out at Claudia's apartment for four hours, basically. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's a coincidence that obviously the film is built on coincidences, but it's it feels... It feels contrived, and I think it's a good choice to cut it. Yeah, and, which is weird thinking about a film that is entirely contrived mm-hmm. because it is structured based on coincidence. But then there's something there's something that didn't work even about that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't feel like it uh, lacked anything for not resolving that, and I could see it's just like this movie's already like three plus, and right. it's like, all right, like no, it's uh, I feel like the end product was fine. I, I did read that he um. He wanted to figure out a way in the movie to show that all this was happening within like like two block radius. Two block radius, but it was too confusing. Like the production company was like, "No, people are not going to understand <laughs> what you're talking about." And it's like maybe that plays into what he, he was trying it. to have trouble with, like in the production. I, I mean, he set up like in the prologue having like the uh, like the football X's and O's and like the drawing the lines like on a you know screen just to show you know show exactly where things were happening right you could have done that with like a map of like the san fernando valley which by the way is my favorite character in the movie the san fernando valley oh it's almost like Uh, in a woody allen film on new york as a character in itself yeah Uh, i don't think we need it no i mean we know we know we're in los angeles Mm -hmm. yeah um, I think I if, yeah, I, I think, think if I need. if I had to look at a map and then also try to start remembering all these characters' names, yeah. some of them with the same names, then also relate them to a location right. like, that he the showed studio? Where's ten the, minutes the ago. <laughs> just, he just starts color coding everything. Yeah, yeah. No, it would have been cool to have like some kind of moment in the film where like all the characters were like in the same frame together, or at least the same scene. If, if circumstances brought them there, yeah, which maybe what, what he was going for. It almost happened with the, uh, it wasn't the same frame, but like in, at the end when everybody's in the cars and yeah. you see somebody drive by the other person who's... Does yeah. Altman ever do that? Does Altman ever bring everybody together? I think he did that in Nashville, but it's been a while since I've seen that. It seems like I, a movie where they all kind of come together at the, fi- the very final concert in the movie before the singer gets shot. Oh, well, that, that makes sense because if, yeah. if it's a concert, that's why everybody's getting together. Right. You yeah. have to you have to introduce an event in Magnolia that everybody is connected to mm, to bring right. them all together. Yeah. They're right. all going to the Seduce and, Seduce and Destroy seminar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all of the audience. Yeah. They all yeah. just happen to be in, yeah, into Stanley's this. dad brings them there. You gotta learn how to respect the cock. <laughs> <laughs> I think the frogs was the event, but I think everybody needed to have their own personal moments. And if they were all together, it would have, wouldn't have been as effective. Yeah. Do you think the frogs actually happened? Like, yeah. Like, did they, is this actually, it was an event? Or is it, do you think maybe the characters all just kind of, this was like internally happening to them in their brains? Like, a, not a hallucination, but just like, this is what it felt like at these moments. Because mm. no one else really like responds to the frogs besides them. And it's very like conspicuously like empty streets. Yeah, like, nobody's starting, like, nobody started to clean them up. They're yeah, I mean, still I know it's raining morning, all day, yeah. but like, the, even like when Jim Curran is bringing um, Quiz Kid Donnie Smith, like, into like the over the hanging of the gas station like mm-hmm. there's no one out, like getting gas there's no one out there like what's going on there's frogs falling from the sky i mean if frogs fell from the sky the next morning i'm not leaving my fucking house <laughs> right. and also like you know the internet's not as prevalent at this point mm-hmm. so it's like i don't know what the fuck's going on it's not like i'm going on twitter being like oh you know what i mean i'm gonna either have killed myself because i think i've finally snapped or i'm like in my basement not leave you know what i mean i'm like i'm never leaving the house again so it's like I've got enough seltzer here for, <laughs> yeah, yeah. for a week. <laughs> yeah. I've already tried to kill myself with a gun and a frog knocked the gun out of my hand for falling through my skylight. I'm never leaving the house again. Yeah. Um which that moment uh I don't know uh, the whole Claudia thing with uh he's not sure if he molested her or not. He knows. Yeah, yeah he knows. He knows. And but then when the her mother comes in and they're like embracing and then it shows zooms in on the painting and it's like but it did happen fucking killed me i was like oh my god <laughs> like i don't know i love this he, he movie kinda like does he like change the really? lens in that shot I, I didn't i didn't read that that push in as uh, whoa whoa <laughs> i didn't read that push in on that phrase 
specifically referencing the Claudia story. I thought it was more generally referencing the frogs. Oh, okay. That's how I read that. Oh, really? See, I I directly linked that to her father doing that to her. Mm -hmm. And then, like, because the mother, who like, finally embraces her and she knows what she went through and she just found out. And then it's like, yeah, I think I think it maybe references both where it's like, yes, this is happening. It's like you don't like, you know, you never think your father's going to do this. And you also never think frogs are going to fall from the sky. But it happened. And it's, it's, I think it was just like that's how I took it anyway. And it was very I was like, holy. And, effective. I mean, that too links back to what you you have a much more pessimistic <laughs> take on this film than I do. I find oh, okay. this. Um, even your reading of Stanley Specter too, when when he's like, when he finds out that he's not alone, he's just like, your reading is, oh, I've discovered I'm just another one of in a long line of children being exploited by adults around them, and that's okay because I'm not alone. Yeah, what? like that's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it's not because it's just like, oh, other people have my experiences. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, I guess I just relate it to it's like. You know, I've had depression my whole life, and then when I found out that it was a thing, I was like, oh my god, this is, like, out of my control? You know what I mean? It's like, this isn't a choice. Like, I'm not just, like, a wet blanket. I'm like, holy shit, like, other people feel this way. And it's just, like, I don't know. It, it definitely, it's it's sad. It's definitely, like, real sad. But, um, I don't know. Is there an optimistic way to look at the Stanley thing? Like, wh- what do you think? Well, yeah, I think the last shot of him is, like, him kind of beginning to stand to his dad, say, Dad, you need to be nicer to me now. Like the Stanley in the beginning of the film probably wouldn't be saying that. He just kind of goes along with, you know, yeah. The, his dad even like says to the parents in the agreement, like, yeah, to like kind of like slightly abuse the kids, you know, just so they, you know, they don't get out of line. Yeah. Just laying out his parenting approach of mm-hmm. as just being passive aggressive. Right. Here. Yeah. But no, I read that it was like Stanley, he's going to be, he's going to get better. You know, it feels he's, like, he's yeah. He's going to find a way out of this or just find a way to just to live with it or just use his intellect in a way that's yeah. healthier for everybody. Yeah. For a kid as smart as him, I think he comes to the realization that he can use this intel like he gets to be the person to decide how to employ his intelligence and yeah. that's sort of the realization that he's coming to as yeah. opposed to allowing other people to utilize his intelligence right i agree yeah no i, I felt like it was positive in that way I, I just because he was just like i don't know i feel like he was just learning more about himself and it was more of like a personal revelation and it felt like it felt positive to me in that way i could see how it's also very pessimistic, though. Uh, and if, if him standing up to his father is the beginning of something, then great. I, I think I just, in that moment, I just immediately went dark where I was like, oh, no, he's just rolling over again. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but then also, what can he do in that moment besides he's going to kill his dad? Like, no, he's not going to do that. You know what I mean? He's not going to, he's still a kid. I, I think all of the storylines are the beginning of something at the end of the film. So f- Frank and... Um, and Julianne Moore, uh, Lily, no. Lily. Yeah, li- uh, no, Lily's uh, his Lily's mom, the, yeah. And li- I, there's there's the beginning of something, like there's a connection there and there's mm-hmm. going to be hopefully something continuing there. You've got Jim and Claudia, mm-hmm. Claudia and her mother. Um, the, the only thing that's not a beginning is Jimmy Gator. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, you know. They probably burned to death. Yeah, the, yeah, I was expecting them to show it, him dead at the end yeah. they didn't yeah like the corner like they already picked up uh earl's body and the dog and like oh we gotta go to the jimmy gator's house next yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a casual expository yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got room in the van <laughs> right right but yeah it's implied that the house probably burns down right right i i, I, I think, think it was more explicit in the okay. script oh uh, okay yeah because yeah, like, i he deserves to burn for what he did you right know? well it's like when he's, he's like oh no you're not gonna be able to kill yourself you're not gonna have control of this you're still gonna just i don't know it's definitely like some kind of higher power just being like no yeah. The universe is like, no, you don't get to die your way. You're a piece of shit. Mm. Like, yeah. Ugh. Oh, yeah. And then um, what other characters? Was that it? Is that all the narratives? Was it Donnie Smith? The beginnings? Who's oh, one, yeah. Who's one that I kind of also had like on this reading just like related to in a sick way where just of doing things just to maybe impress somebody, but like it's not healthy for you. Not healthy at all. You, you got know? a lot of love, but you just yeah. don't know where to put I, it. Yeah. It's... <laughs> so that's how you, that's why you open it with, okay, mm-hmm. let's. Let's delve into this. I, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, because we haven't gotten to yours yeah. yet. No, just just the fact that like you know he, he would see someone he's attracted to and like oh he's he's got braces so let me get braces. Mm-hmm. You know it's 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 a very demented way of thinking in, in terms of like of, of the courtship process. 
which is something that we've, you know, they, they kind of, it's almost mirrored in the Seduce and Destroy in, uh, seminar where like, yeah, like relationships and courtship, it's, it's a hard process and there's not really a manual for it. Though they're obviously selling a manual for it, you know, in these seminars. A couple of them. There's couple. a blue one and yeah. a white one. Yeah, and you notice it comes with a couple of water bottles as well. Oh, and a, and a free calendar. Yeah, I've given you a calendar. Like how, that's just yeah. the yeah. kind of prick I am. <laughs> yeah. So if Donnie, like, if Quiz Kid Donnie Smith <laughs> were, were to attend one of these uh, Frank TJ Maggie seminars, would he be in a better place? Uh, no. Probably not. No, he'd no. be in a worse place. He's... Nobody's being in a better place by going to one of yeah. these things. No. Ugh. Yeah, that's rough. Mm-hmm. So then I'm going to... I I might want to retract my these are beginnings statement because I don't know what Donnie Smith has learned. I don't know. I, he's is it him? Is it because he says I'm stupid now? Is it because of the lightning strike that he's not smart anymore? Is he just is it just him just getting older and he's like yeah like any child celebrity? Yeah, I don't. I didn't, I didn't read it as the lightning strike had anything to do with it. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that's what he was trying to get I th- across. I think. His drunken, um, I used to be smart, but I'm stupid now. I, th- I feel like that's more of, um, you know, he he's basically saying I used to have, I used to be this precocious person. I used to, I used to have value for other people, but now uh, like people don't find the value in me mm-hmm. anymore. And like, I don't have the soft people skills in order to make connections with people because mm-hmm. that's basically how he used to value himself was I've, I like make people happy through this entertainment. He no longer has that. Mm-hmm. He he doesn't see that people value him anymore. Right. I think he still has some smarts. He was rattling off like a bunch of statistics about like uh about elements in the bar. But like yeah. but like that knowledge it only gets you so it's far. Just, you know? it's, just trivia. it's just trivia, yeah. Yeah. It's it's no life skill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's that's trivial. the thing about trivia. It's trivial. Mm-hmm. And then somehow he rabbited towards a career in sales at this like electronic store. Yeah. Which I don't know what he. I, I'm curious to what he did before then, because he's obviously in like a ton of debt. Yeah, like in the in the old uh, clips of the game show. I mean, he was like maybe 10 or 11 years old, and then you know he was like 40. Yeah. So what happened in those years? Does he go to college? Yeah. Does he, what yeah. does he do? I mean, I, I just know that his parents. His money, yeah, his parents stole his yeah. money, so he didn't have any money by the time he was, you know, older. I guess. Yeah. Again, his parents fucking him over. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. He's like definitely. Yeah, I think he's just there as a punching bag, and he's like all these like he's the future of all these children, like pers- you know, it's like oh, you're all heading in this direction. Like that's the one thing I've always found a little on the nose is the fact that like we have like Quiz Kid Donnie Smith, he's like the ghost of Christmas past, and then mm-hmm. we have Quiz Kid Stanley Specter. And would the movie have worked better if it wasn't such on the nose? Like here's the here's the current Quiz Kid, now here's like the former Quiz Kid, and see the cycles of abuse they've gone through if they were to make if they made like stanley specter like a child actor or someone who's still like kind of being exploited for his his, his talents with mm-hmm. that i i don't again it doesn't feel contrived for a film built on coincidence that's i think that's mm. part of the structure and part of the plotting it's it's building in within the structure of the film itself it's saying like you know if you were watching a film that doesn't explicitly have like the meta scene of Phil Hoffman saying, this is the scene in the film where you help me. And I think they put these scenes in the film in film. Like you, you feel like that should be cheesy, but it's not. No, it I love that. It crushes you. Mm-hmm. And I think the film then is able to structure itself as saying like, you're going to accept these coincidences and these on the nose plotting devices because we're explicitly telling you that like this is constructed and these things happen all, and these things happen all the time there's there's a reason mm-hmm. drama exists right cuz right. like, yeah. these things happen all the time yeah but still i don't know what i don't know what donnie learns at the end of the film and i yeah. i don't know how i feel about him breaking his teeth i feel like that was a little too like just right. fucking now kicking you him do with knee it. braces yeah. yeah you know what i mean like i thought i thought i didn't think we needed that cuz i was like at first, I was like, oh, maybe he just busted his nose, because I think the teeth would be a little too obvious. And then I was like, oh, no, it's his teeth. And I was just like, oh, you know, it's fine. But it's like we could have had him not have that. And just I think the shame of him failing and having to go back and put the money back would be it would have been good enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know what he what he still had. He still broke. He still has no job. Um, yeah. Doc Ock fired him. Doc Ock fired him. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't think he. 
has any yeah. <laughs> there's no hope for him <laughs> it's not like stanley where he's still got his whole life ahead of him it's like no that's it this is your life and you got it yeah, you can get oral surgery, but how are you going to afford it? I hope at least he gets a new uh, key ring situation with like that zip. Yeah. What do you call those? Like the, the, the It's like on the, the wire. The key yeah, ring. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the word is. Yeah. Retractable. They're retractable Yeah, sure, key. yeah. Yeah. I love in the beginning how they set it up in the beginning of the movie where he like He turns. almost does it. Yeah. <laughs> and then... He, but then he like le- at the end he leaves it in there, but he doesn't do anything about it. And and then he, uh, when he comes back, yeah. he's like, "Wait, what happened?" And it's oh like, yeah, I broke my key in the lock. But he's also panicked and <laughs> right, his adrenaline's going, going flying. He's also drunk. He's also very drunk. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He sobered up a little bit. I yeah, I didn't remember the heist thing. I thought he was gonna kill himself when he was like because before you see he's laying out the keys. I thought he was loading a gun, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, it, it was, that sucks." But then he's like, "Oh wait, no. What does he have the keys for?" And then I remember, and then they showed the stereo store, and I was like, oh. No need for braces, Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> I lent you enough money. Speaking um, of teeth, did anybody notice, and once you see it, you can't unsee it, Tom Cruise has a middle front tooth. No. I didn't notice this. In the... <laughs> Jaya is furrowed his brow, and he's looking into his script book. So in the interview <laughs> s- sequences... Oh, yeah, page 67. Uh, interior... It's right after the beat. Yeah. It says yeah, right after beat. extra tooth. Yeah, he smiles. No, I didn't. It's, there's like this non-centered, non-symmetrical thing that's going on. And I'm, it, it's, you don't register it until like you're deliberately looking for it for whatever reason. And then you're like, there's something like either like his face is all in the right place. And then just like all of his jaw inside it is somehow shifted like yeah. over to one side. Interesting. It's it's actually noticeable in the Guinevere interview because you're in close up in mm-hmm. the shot reverse shot for all of it. It's interesting. I did not pick up on that. I picked up on Philip Seymour Hoffman's like he's got like a little either discoloration or a chipped front tooth, and that was bothering me. But it was only when he was tight on his face. But I did not notice the Tom Cruise. Yeah, it's it's there. Wow. Do you guys have Let's a favorite back. Uh, shot in the movie? Like a you know a frame, an image that stands out to you when you think of Magnolia. Um, I'm gonna need a minute to think about it. I know you you tweeted I tw- your favorite I image. Found I something think. something a little a little clever. Um, it, they, you figured out how to use Twitter. I figured out <laughs> finally figured out how to use Twitter. Yeah, you need, I'm telling sweet, you, need, likes. Yeah, you need a username and a password. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a scene in the bar with um, the Quiz Kid Donnie Smith, and uh, I believe his character is Thurston Howell, the yes. uh, the man at the other at the, at the end of the bar. And they keep uh, repeating the phrase, uh, it's dangerous to confuse children with angels. Uh, and no, it is not dangerous mm-hmm. to confuse children with angels. Later on, there's a shot, a pretty decent close-up of uh, Stanley Spectre. And behind him... On the game show. On the game show. He's sitting, sitting down. And behind him, there's like you know all kinds of images of like knowledge. Like There's like the atoms and there's like books and... Stuff like that. And there's one image right behind Stanley that is the staff of a Sepleus, which is uh, the serpent and twine rod that is usually, uh, you know... Medical med- the, the medical uh, The medical picture. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see that in that there's an angel wing kind of that's kind of in the background, and it's right behind Stanley. It's not quite like by his shoulders, but it's kind of enough where it's like, oh, that's kind of like an angel wing that Stanley has... Interesting. Uh, yeah, I could show it to you. I don't know if I've noticed that explicitly, but yeah, this is I noticed that during. Time. I'm sure I, my brain did. Yeah, yeah, because you tweeted that, and I looked at the photo. I'm like, oh, it's probably because of the color and stuff like that. But then I was watching the movie, and I was like, oh, it's like he has wings. He's got wings. He's an angel. That's uh, deliberate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like it. it. Mm-hmm. It's cool. I, yeah, it's. I mean, it's a good shot, even right. without that realization. It's, like, I don't know. Yeah. I just love it should how be it shot. Looks. It should, that shot should be taught in all film schools. So I I have to go with the um, opening sequence, of course. Mm-hmm. Just all of the the editing and the shot construction. It's a little manic, though. It can it gets to be a little much, especially when it keeps going mm-hmm. until you finally get to gym and it slows down for a second. Uh, but I I gotta go with the last shot. Yes. Gotta oh, the, the, the smile. Last shot. The fourth wall break. And for we've been dancing around it this entire time. We've been talking about like the meta nature of the film and then like you've got the fourth wall break and by this point you're like you're ready for it yeah yeah. i don't know if you're ready for it but like you're willing to just be like cool or like (sighs) yeah it's like a relief it's like oh god 
that fills me with such joy. That's why I wrote like that smile fills me with such joy at the end. You know, like things are. I you like to think things are gonna get better for her and just with the little uh, guitar riff. Yeah, mm-hmm. the way the, the Amy song that just it, that that yeah that one moment that moment that's magnolia. I think for me it was just that pushing on that painting just because of that. Uh, that that's that, a great that's a great shot just the, when they're collapsed and it's like she's like mom 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 mommy and it's like she's a little girl again mm-hmm. and then it just like zooms in on that and it's the, I, lens, the lens changes right yeah there's like yeah. a like a diopter flip or mm-hmm. something it's like when you're in the in the eye doctor's office and they flip <laughs> yes your, yeah. yeah better or worse yeah. <laughs> option <laughs> clearer one? now option two, two. Option again one option one <laughs> yeah it's like a um it's like a one one point six adapter or something. Yeah, that yeah. Just flipping on. I think that's pretty. It's pretty cool technique. Yeah, I think that was the most emotionally resonant like shot for me. But I also am a sucker for the long takes when they're in the TV studio and going around. I love that. Just like you leave Stanley and then like they come back down the hallway and it's just like we continuous. A, we get an elevator. Yeah, we get an elevator in there. That's it's really nice. really cool. It's showy. It's it's yeah. It's a young man's game. You know mm-hmm. his. You compare his long takes in Magnolia to his long takes in Inherent Vice, which are literally like locked down on a tripod or like they're three or four minute long takes. Yeah. And maybe he dollies in a little bit. Yeah. And it's again, it's one of those things that it's like, oh, this I'm it's so much more subtle that your brain doesn't really even register it till you're in like the third minute of the take. You're like, is this? Oh, like I just been I've been really paying attention to this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's a subtlety that he. This film does not do subtle. This no. film, the subtext is. It's the all text. out there. It yeah. is. It is out there. It is on its sleeve. That's that's probably why, as a 17 year old, it was accessible. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's very flashy. It's very like, I don't know. You, it's, it's something you can, cast. You there's um, more you can think about, but it's also you don't need to to get everything out of the movie. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, I don't know. Something like the master. That's all subtext oh yeah like even i mean although in the last scene again <laughs> uh phil hoffman is singing i want to get you on a slow boat to china to joaquin i'm like okay that's, yeah yeah that's on the nose <laughs> yeah yeah what is it, the last thing he says to me is like i dare you to find like something where you don't need a master i forget what the last i, 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 I don't remember what it was i am but it was great. the master yeah yeah the titular line yes. and then Smiles at the camera, breaks fourth wall, the end. <laughs> Any I, man plays. <laughs> yeah, I wish every one of his movies ended that way. Like, Daniel D. Lewis turns to the camera. I'm finished. And yeah, then smiles, yeah, Amy yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it did happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did drink your milkshake, Eli. I said there would be blood. There was blood. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, end. The <laughs> end. And then he reads all the credits. <laughs> Best boy, Donnie Wilcox. <laughs> Starring me, Daniel Day Lewis. Based on a novel <laughs> by Upton Sinclair entitled Oil. <laughs> the characters in this film are purely fictitious, and any any connections to real persons. Cinematography by Roger Deakins. <laughs> oh, I would love that. Oh milk my God. and sports. Milk and sports. I want to just have him. Can we talk about Louise? Oh. Yeah. Louise, remi- refresh my memory. Milk and sports, milk and sports, milk and spa- sports. <laughs> milk and sports. There's the adult on the, on, the other, on the other panel of the game show. Oh, uh, yes. I love him. He's such a great character. He never answered any questions, though, I don't believe. Well, he, his specialty was milk and sports. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no questions about dairy or cheese. Oh, God. I didn't. I, it took me a while to figure out. I was like, how the fuck does this game show work? Why are there three adults and three kids? And I guess the adults are on a team, but they're also... F- Fighting for them, yeah. I think their the own? adults are on, on their own team. The kids are on one team. So they split the money, but then there's like right, a streak yeah. going on, and it seems like the game show is like six hours long. I don't know because it's like going through the whole movie, and I know the whole movie doesn't take place in an hour. Wait, and they do it live? And they do it live? Why? Why are you doing it's a all game day. show live? <laughs> he starts in the morning, and by and the time at like three thirty in the afternoon too. So you know, yeah, like who's watching that? No one's who's home from work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Unless, no, it can't be live. Well, they can really cut to card, cut to card. And yeah. Then, and then this, Claudette's watching it live. Unless unless the Claudette stuff, is, no, because it's all happening at the same Dixon time. Watched, Dixon's watching it live, too. There's the one yeah. shot where I think the worm, like, walks up to him, and he's he's at a, he's someone's house. He's watching It's also on show. in the bar. Yeah. Because I, that's why he starts doing the trivia. I'm never, uh, I, I'm never really, 
I'm not willing to pick at that scab, I think, yeah. in this film. But as far as, like, something logically that could have been clarified. Yeah. If you really want to get into it. But I think it, it works fine if it's live. It just doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any... No, because it's, like, so long. It's, like, the entire, like, the movie, this game show's happening. And it's, like, what is this game show, like, eight hours long? Like, yeah. It would make sense if it was a taping. Yeah. And if when people are watching the TV show, if it's, um, if it's like yesterday's taping, you know yeah. what I mean? That makes sense. Mm-hmm. But I think the implication is like, there's, this is just happening live and it's yeah. going out to the world. Right. Which, again, it raises the dramatic stakes. True. Can we, can we talk briefly about the terrible pharmacist that Linda encounters? Awful. Yeah. You he's fuck. Just, yeah. Is that what she said? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Suck my dick. That's what's wrong. <laughs> Way that he's like, oh man, you must have a lot of problems. You need all these all Boy, these drugs. Really like, have quite a party with yeah. all this stuff. I feel like the first thing they teach, like, just don't. You just, you just, they give you the prescription. You get the drugs. They pay for it. If you know. Well, and he's saying it around yeah. his the the elder pharmacist guy, and then at one point he calls him back over, and they think he's gonna just like smack yeah, him upside yeah, the head. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but no, he just like here's the drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a uh, I mean, great gave, scene. It was a great moment with her, but like yeah. just the fact that this guy was like, eh, he must. He must have a lot going on in your life. You need all these drugs, all these painkillers. Well, at that point, Julianne Moore was firmly at 11. She yes. needed to remain at 11. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole time. Yeah, I, I love this. I love the twist on her character because she plays such an archetype with like the, yeah, the young woman marries the old man for money. Mm-hmm. But then the fact that she falls in love with him as he's dying and it's like, and then she doesn't want the money. Like that whole, like, because you think she's going to go into the will thing being like she wants the money or like, I don't know. It's just, I love that it felt more real, I guess. I don't know. It was interesting. I love that. Yeah, it made me like her character a lot. <laughs> something I never picked up on was like the fact that when she was early on trying to kill herself in the garage when she leaves the car. Oh, running, yeah. Like, I never like put that together. I like, almost didn't catch that. Yeah. Because I don't really. It's, just, it's a little subtle. You're just like, oh, she's still in the, in the garage. The door's closed. But the she's, engine's running. She sees the drugs and she's like, mm-hmm. Earl is suffering. Mm-hmm. Like, I need to actually do this for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the liquid morphine. Oof. Yeah, um, I love how uh, wrote down here that well the word fuck is used 190 times. That's just a little <laughs> I, trivia. I read that as well. <laughs> but I love how everybody k- keeps saying it's raining cats and dogs out there, like over and over again. It happens at least three times where there's like, oh yeah, it's raining cats and dogs out there. Stanley's then, dad says it when he yeah, comes yeah, in. Yeah, Stanley's dad says it. J- Officer Jim says it. I think at one point. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know, I, just like like a cup of coffee on a day like this. Yeah, yeah. Unless it's iced coffee. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a it's a it's a good cup of coffee for not being fresh. <laughs> anyway, yeah, like he just tosses it in the yeah, sink yeah. without looking. While well, she's in the bedroom blowing lines. <laughs> you got a cop in your house. So that's the natural thing to do. Is like yeah. I got to calm down. I'm gonna yeah. go do some coke. How long was he there for? Like an hour or so. Like, I feel like as long as the yeah. game show. It's like six hours. You just stood there in awkward silence, and every 15 minutes she went to the room to do another line. <laughs> it's just, I've, I've had that situation, I feel like, where I've, uh, you, you know, you, you have a party or a get-together at your house, and you have the one person at the end who just won't leave, and they just keep hanging around. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yep. trying to give them a hint to leave, and it's like, yeah, no, um, you know, boy, it sure is late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are you up to tomorrow? And it's like, ugh. Well, like, I think, obviously, I'm sleeping in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we were both in a situation like that a couple years ago. We were at a New Year's Eve party at a friend's bars, and uh-huh. we were just hanging out the next day. And they, they started putting on uh, bad Adam Sandler movies. Just as, oh, okay. they, they, later on, they're like, "Yeah, we just wanted you guys just to leave our house, so we put on the worst movie ever." But we just stayed and just riffed <laughs> so on it for a couple hours. <laughs> we ended up watching like three straight to Netflix Adam Sandler films. Yeah. Wow! In a row. Wow! And it's just like, yeah, I can't get rid of these guys. I've I've been that guy too. I'm pretty sure. I can't think of a specific instance, but yeah. where you just, yeah, Ugh. that's been me. Every time I bought drugs in, in college, was just like, um, you feel like you got to hang yeah, out. You got to hang out with the person. And it's like, no, this can just be purely it. transactional. Yeah. yeah, you can just. Well, I would assume you can just in and out and, and right. Leave. But then that might affect your relationship with the dealer. Well, and if, if this transaction is anything like any other. Tr- capitalistic transaction which is I, I assume it is yeah i wouldn't know right you don't have to, when you go to wegman's you don't have to hang out with mr wegman if you want to buy like a bag of broccoli he's dead jaya mr wegman's dead shit like 2004 how wow. are they, how are they still open and like does did he give, give the keys to somebody before he died or? i mean must have he, they're not as rich as disney i mean walt disney's frozen 
and one day he's going to come back and he's going to be real mad at all the Jews and showbiz. Mm-hmm. Um, real mad. Grave, like, but he... I'm sure I'm sure Mr. Wegman's in the freezer in the back. He's behind the. Uh, that'd, behind be the me. that'd be the funniest thing if it's like when Disney Plus launches, like everyone's like, "Oh, this could be the Mandalorian and like all the old Disney movies," and then just like the app loads and there's just like one video you click on and it's just like. Like this, like just a, a cryogenic chamber, just like just like ice melting everywhere, <laughs> and just a... so yeah, yeah. Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, uh, just I don't know, just his whole fucking. <laughs> I love that his his assistant <laughs> is named uh, Captain Muffy, so uh, the implication oh is he just has to give all of his his everyone around all of his body men around him just like just like sexualized. So who's names. Janet? Janet is it Janet Captain Muffy? No, no, Jan- no, Janet. No, Captain Muffy's like, like that assistant. tall guy. That's with oh him. him. Okay. He's like the Henry Rollins looking dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What uh, I want you to do, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> Who's played by uh, Mary Lynn Rice Cub? The oh. yeah. Oh, from Twenty Four. Comedian from Twenty Four from Mr. Show. Wow. And she actually has uh, a couple of scenes. There's a deleted uh, extended scene of the one of the seminars that he gives. He's talking about like uh, first you do is you pick up the phone, and it goes in this whole script the sequence of like uh, Frank T J Mackey. You know, having this like making excuses, like making a date with this girl, and then showing up on her front doorstep crying and like, oh, my cat, my neighbor's cat died. Oh, that's right. Uh, She's playing that character. She plays that character, and it's really, there's actually a really funny couple shots of Tom Cruise like just playing, like he's playing video games, he's eating junk food on the couch, watching TV. Like, there's something we never see of yeah. these, these human moments of Tom Cruise. Yeah, but, I feel uh, like yeah, I feel like that's good because you don't see him be a human until the end mm-hmm. when he breaks yeah, down. Yeah, you you're not. You're not supposed to identify this person as a human. Yeah. Like, yeah. But and, as, I mean, and that's what he wants. He just wants to be this figurehead of his dick. I don't know. Like, just, like, he also, it's like a whole masterclass of acting where, like, when he's getting caught in those lies in the interview and just, like, the way his face just kind of pauses and just, like, he made very, very measured responses, you know, like, oh, well, it, it wouldn't, I was never officially on the books there. You know, I was, I sat in on classes and uh, the stuff about, uh, you know, miss sims his caretaker just the way that's when it, it all starts falling apart he there he knows but. exactly where this is going mm-hmm. though as soon as there's like that initial turn and there's this recognition of oh like i'm not i can't walk out of this and she's not gonna let me walk out of this yeah yeah and then he just stonewalls her you know silently judging <laughs> Yeah, it's such Wait, a. Is it silently or is it quietly? Quietly judging you. My apologies. <laughs> yeah, because you can't be totally silent while judging. Quietly judging. You asked <laughs> <Yeah>. your questions. <laughs> I don't know. It. it he's. It's. You, it's cringeworthy. His it is. seminar, but it's always been cringeworthy. We're not going back and rewatching it and saying, "Oh, how like how could you have done this?" Oh, this is really problematic. Now, yeah, it's like no, that was like, no. It's <laughs> we knew this was problematic when we watched this. Yeah. Like, we laughed at it, but we also knew that, like, this dude is messed up. He's, like, and then we realized later on through that interview, he's this way by choice, like, to protect himself. Yeah, yeah, because he, even on said stage, he says this is bullshit. Like, he doesn't really, it seems like he doesn't really believe all this stuff. It's just a character that he's come up with. Exactly. Right. He's, it actually turns out that this asshole is somewhat sympathetic. Yeah, and the contrast because he was a caretaker for his mother, and then between him and Hoffman being a caretaker for his father, mm. and it's just like I don't know having them be in the same room and Philip Seymour Hoffman's watching him have that final conversation, not even a conversation with his, just yelling at his father. I don't know. It was just definitely like I don't know this way it's shot. With Hoffman's like behind him and like out of focus. I don't know. It's just like like the lights in the back are they're kind of like slightly kind of just shimmering. Yep. Yeah, it's like. You can just kind of feel the tension just kind of emanating from him. Um, yeah, because it, yeah. it, it's, it's all one shot, and they do, like, I believe they cut to another segment of the movie, but they return to that exact, exact same exactly, shot. Yeah. It, which, you know, it begins with him, like, just kind of anger and, like, I hope you fucking die. Mm-hmm. And then it ends with him, like, don't you go away, you fucking asshole. Just yeah. Kind of his hands clasped together, crying. Yeah. And yeah. Phil, I always wish that was just like one shot that was not, like, interrupted by anything else. Yeah. But, yeah. And Phil. I will drop kick those fucking <laughs> yeah. dogs. Yeah, yeah he says, says that. He twice. says he says that, and then like when he's coming, he's like, "Oh, well, this is Muffy." Or this, he even introduces yeah, the dogs, yeah, yeah. you know, to him. <laughs> like, this shit. We're all in the living room. They yeah. stay away from the body. This is yeah, Daniel. Yeah. This is Seth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the yeah. It's the whole theme of like the past is not done with us. Then it's just like we may be through with the past, but the past ain't done with us. Exactly. We met on the level, and we're parting on the square. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I love fun, that. Fun Tom Cruise trivia. I do not believe he runs in this film. Oh, you're right. He, he, he walks fast and down the hotel hallway, I believe. Yeah. But that's, yeah. Not, no running. There's no cardio in this yeah. film. No cardio. Wow. Interesting. Mm-hmm. 1999 was not a big cardio year for Tom Cruise films because he got eyes wide shut and he's just sort of wandering around in a daze for all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's he not, does. Although when well, Vanilla Sky was 2001 because he's running around oh, in an empty city in that. Times Square, they shut that thing down. He does do a little bit of, uh, like he has to show off a little bit where he does that weird backflip. Yeah. And he's in his underwear. Yeah. Uh, his heart he's all jacked up. Yeah. Yeah. That, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so jazzed at these seminars. Oh my God. What a weird, like this woman he's never met. And then he's just like in his underwear, full erection. Right. And just like <laughs> shirt off. It's like, this isn't normal. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Why? So, like, what are we watching here? Yeah. Yeah. So weird. And she's even like, she's, she even just takes the bait and like straight up kind of emasculates him. Yes. Within seconds. It's just like, be a good boy yeah yeah and he's like oh okay yeah he's like yeah <laughs> um one of my favorite lines in the movie is uh when uh <laughs> with donnie is just like talking about the braces and the lightning and stuff like that and then the guy at the bar is just like i don't know man you know, i got hit by lightning once i think braces are a good idea <laughs> just like it's very quiet and uh i don't know i, I got a kick out of that and the guy who plays thurston the uh kind of c thomas howell yeah yeah yeah, yeah he's in the burbs which we're going to be covering oh, soon. Yeah. He plays uh, Mr. Klopek in The Burbs. Klopek. Klopek. Yeah. So. We keep, we keep losing ensemble members from this film. So, Robards within like a year past. Oh, the guy put Earl, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, the, the person who played Jimmy Gator's wife, I think she has since passed. I think so. Yeah. Who was that? I recognized her. Uh, um. I think I've seen her in some stuff before, but uh, yeah, Hoffman, of course. Bill Hoffman, obviously. Hoffman. Ricky J. Ricky J. Recently, even the kid who plays, uh, I think his name is Jeremy Blackwell. He he pretty much retired from acting, or he just hasn't done. He really played. Anything. Uh, he played uh, Stanley Specter. Stanley, okay. Yeah. Huh. Not to say that's the same as death, but still. And all the frogs who the thieves for the movie have since mm-hmm. passed. Yes, it's very unfortunate. Yeah. This is on number one of Peter's. Probably like, all those don't dogs watch too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I like how some of the frogs were still alive. Yeah. And hopping around, even though they fell. Some of them might land distance. on, like, you know, a marshmallow. Yeah, or... if they land on a tree or something. There's yeah, a lot of palm yeah. trees. Yeah. Even um, those land in the water. The frogs looked really good. You know, I know. why that is? They, uh, please tell me. Because they, they mix practical effects with CGI instead yeah. of just relying all on CGI. That's the way to do it. So. Yeah, that shot has not aged well, though. Which shot? The shot, like, going down into the skyline. Oh, yeah, no, that looks frog. really yeah. bad. That's, I mean, for the. There's got to be a few effect shots in yeah. that movie, but to blatantly put that effect shot in, that has not aged well. Yeah, I agree. Has anything else not aged well? We sort of touched on Tom Cruise. Uh, en- ensemble drama films? They don't really do too many of those anymore. Well, what was Avengers Endgame? Like dra- ensemble drama films without... Um, lasers. Lasers? <laughs> And unicorn in space. <laughs> Dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, but I don't think that's like because uh, we've aged out of that culturally. Yeah. I think it's just something that people would still be into, but we have too many comic book movies now. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's just that I think there's just. Look, not, look, we, need, we need a fourth Thor film. A fourth a Thor for a Thor four? A Thor four. Thor four. Four four? Four four. four, four. Yeah, we need a four, uh, four Thor. Mm-hmm. But what's aged the worst? Um, what do you think? I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, that shot looked really bad uh i thought that i don't I, yeah i don't know i don't know what's really i mean things are a product of their time i mean like is that not to, not to, i can't judge it not for to negate your question but like yeah this was made in 1998 1999 and it is maybe product of its time maybe jim curring yeah jim has not aged very well no oh in terms of like a cop just kind of like yeah himself in your home that, asking for coffee and that scene where he comes into the woman's home in the beginning was very like I don't I didn't remember this movie I didn't remember that there actually was a body but it's like does he can he do this it's like he said the door was open um and they got he got a call about a disturbance and she is freaking out on him but it's like it also feels very like yeah because of the times now it's like ugh ugh I, I like I had a probably way different reaction than I had when I was a kid mm-hmm. when I was when I saw this you know it's like I don't know that yeah that scene that scene though is 
is doing something and it knows what it's it's turning for yeah. you. It's giving you the hint of like like oh this this guy just introduced himself to us in the right. monologue. He thinks he's a dude on cops and he's going in and harassing a black woman. Mm-hmm. And then there's that turn that like oh maybe like a racist clock is right once a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like and, he was right. Yeah, the episode. Yeah. So Jim's storyline does feel a little dated now. Yeah. But I think again we we can overlook certain things in it. Yeah. Certain things you can't though. Right, right. Yeah. I do um I don't know the stuff he says when he's by himself. He's so eloquent. I don't know, and well spoken. It's like a shame that he's not being filmed. I don't know. It's just like he's I don't know, it's such an interesting character and no I love how he finds the body and nobody he doesn't get even get to say anything about you know like he cut off by the cop who wasn't even there and it's yeah. it's in the background it's yeah. so in the background uh, she was kind of belligerent when I, uh, oh okay never mind <laughs> I like how you you do John C Riley as Kermit the Frog <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she was kind of belligerent mm, I lost my gun today mm. <laughs> uh, I wanted to tell you I feel like a fool <laughs> so I'll go mm. yeah, people tell me I look like a Han Solo hmm <laughs> mm. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see if I had any other notes here. Oh, the masonry stuff, which I read in the trivia, uh, his, uh, Jimmy Gator's producer at one moment when he's talking to him, he has a a Masonic ring on. Oh, and then Stanley Lee's also looking at a bunch of books with Masonic undertones and uh, with Hollywood and the Masons and LA and stuff like that. I thought that was kind of, that was interesting, but apparently that's one of those one of those like Hollywood in jokes. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go read the trivia or you have to work there to know about it. Right. Kind of like, I never knew this. There's a, the character in heat who sees the, the witnesses, the first murder with all the TV, like the vagrant with all the TVs. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen heat yet. It's in the very first scene. It's he's a witness, but apparently that's based on like a dude that will just show up to every film set with like a bunch of TVs and like, he just knows every film shoot that's going on and will just show up everywhere. Wow. And so unless you like work out there, you don't know about that. That's true. Wow. Which I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, he's in, he's in the shot. We got, <laughs> I guess we, well what if he's sag? There's, there's TV he's got, I think somebody got him a sag card. And he, yeah. I think he ha- at some point you have to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What if anybody accidentally got a sag card where they just by coincidence walked into frame into enough movies where <laughs> They could apply for a sad card. <laughs> I don't know how many you would need to do. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the rules. And I never will. Nobody knows anything. <laughs> it's true. Thanks, Jaya. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, no, that's not, it's a Hollywood screen or anything. Um, I love how uh, everyone is telling, uh, especially Julianne Moore, <laughs> anytime a woman gets emotional, everybody's like, calm down, mm-hmm. Claudette, calm down. It's just like it's all just men telling women to calm down. <laughs> this movie, I guess maybe that doesn't age very well, but also it's very aware of itself. Yeah, in this movie, especially the pharmacist scene where she gets that moment where she's like, "No, fuck you!" <laughs> like, tell me to calm down. You don't know me, who I am. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, we talked about the meta scene uh, when he's talking about. It. Yeah, I know this is like one of those scenes in the movie. Is that like actually like ninety minutes in? Is that actually the midpoint? I think so. It feels like it. Yeah. Um, I think it was because I paused it. I was very aware of the time because I had to go to the bathroom so many times. Um, but even Earl on his deathbed, when he's just talking about like, oh, it's so stupid, like a dying man with his dying wish on his bed. It's so like, he's like, this is even cliche. It's like they're on the same page. I don't know. You shithead. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, all you say is uh, shitball, shithead, fucking cocksucker. <laughs> Do me a favor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuck myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, right. Fuck myself. Oh, fuck myself. I don't know. Hoffman's the goat. I think it's probably my final thought in this movie is that Hoffman is, uh, I miss him so much. He was my favorite. He yeah. still is. Right, John C. Dude. Riley is really underrated too. Yes, he is. Yeah. Thank God we still have him. I hope we have him forever. I hope we have him working with PTA again in the future. Yeah. I want him to stop doing Will Ferrell and Tim and Eric shit and mm-hmm. go back to PTA. <laughs> I mean, not the knock Joaquin Your Phoenix and Heron Vice, but I think John C. Riley would have been an amazing Doc Sportello. Yeah. Or at least have some role in Heron Vice. I got to see that movie again. That, mu- that was so such a mind fun. fuck, and I didn't so understand it. Fun. The oh my god, the end. When he, what is it? Oh yeah, 
what's his name? Josh Groban kicks down his door and he just starts crying. I was like, I left that movie. I was like, I don't know what no, Josh this Brolin, was. Not Brolin, Josh, not Josh Groban. Yeah. No, not Josh Groban. Josh different, Brolin. That would Very be a different. much different movie. That was a deleted scene when Josh Groban showed up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, just like I left Inherent Vice. I, we should do an episode on that because I want to rewatch that. You want to do the book and the movie? Yeah, I'd love to. I actually I saw it twice in theaters. We had to go. We had to drive like an hour south to some theater so we could see it on like Thursday night, opening night before it actually opened on Friday, instead of like the promenade showing it on a Thursday night. Right, right. They couldn't be bothered. So I drove down there and saw it down there. And then the next night we went with a bunch of people. It's like pretty, pretty full theater. Okay. Friday night, which was pretty nice. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it's good to, cause I don't know. I I was watching, um, a red letter media review and just about how like Quentin Tarantino is like one of the last directors where it's like, you know, his style. And I feel like PTA fits in there too, where it's like, Aside from these, maybe just because I'm getting older, I don't know a lot of the new, you know, filmmakers. I mean, I know Denis Villeneuve. Like, uh, there's like, but I don't know. Everything else starts to just look the same and feel the same. I think it's probably just the Marvel exhaustion. Yeah, they all have like the exact same color palette. Yeah, it's either a blue movie, an orange movie, or a <laughs> you know, a green movie. Um, or a blue. And you got Tarantino. Movie. I mean, yeah. he's recently like re-edited Hateful Eight on the Netflix into like I think four, four episodes. Yeah, four part miniseries. Could we see Paul Thomas Anderson editing Magnolia into like no. no. eighty two ep- like Yeah, he just four. isolates all <laughs> isolates all the narratives into yeah. five short films. Yeah, Eleven. 11 short films I was I would be intri- I would watch oh, that I would watch it <laughs> I would I, somebody's I'm sure there's a fan edit where they've like separated them all so you could watch them all as one uninterrupted piece but I feel like that would also not be good but I don't know yeah Does anybody else have any other thoughts on this movie what are we, we uh, up? what are we doing next I mean, oh episode wise yeah doing hair and vice <laughs> Hair advice. Uh, I don't. I think. Um, you want to come what? back and talk, just talk about Paul Thomas Anderson films? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just be the the PTA scholar. Yeah, no, we yeah we'd love to have you on more. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're doing House of Leaves at one point. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do we're we're gonna do I Heart Huckabees. Yes. Soon the Burbs is coming up because Jai has never seen it and they're showing it at Steel Stacks. It's like one of my favorite comedies growing up since I was a kid. I love the Burbs. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Pee-wee's, we have a whole list. Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah. Christy wanted to do Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah. Oh, John Lunger, I asked last night. I was like, do you have anything you'd like to come on and talk right. about? And he wanted to talk about a short story called Pigeons from Hell. Sure. <laughs> so that'll Let's be happening. Let's do a short story. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. If you have any, if you think of anything that like you're like super into that you want to yeah. come on and talk about, like mm. we're cranking these things out. Right. One day the show will drop. By Someday. now, by now you're listening to this. It has dropped. Uh, <laughs> Unless you hacked into Justin's laptop and just decided just to post everything on uh, Reddit or Pastebin. It wouldn't be difficult. I leave my laptop open in public spaces and unsupervised. So. And the address of the Starbucks where he leaves it open <laughs> is <laughs> the Promenade. Yeah. Uh, is there Starbucks there? there in is. the Barnes and Noble. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a tight Starbucks. There's like five tables, and it's always the same people there. You would know you're there. All, it's you're one of the same people there, right? In, yeah. yeah, you check in on, yeah. on uh, yeah, he goes through Foursquare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Foursquare. Uh, I got really into that uh, after everybody else quit it, so it became the mayor of everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. There might be some conflict of interest there, but yeah, I was like, oh, I went to like some hot dog place in the Poconos, and I'm like, oh, really, Dick's hot dogs? I'm the I'm the mayor already. I've been here once. This is great. <laughs> um. Yeah, so. Yeah. All right, so that's Magnolia. I I just had, like, a cool line that I came up with. This movie's about sad people circling the drain, and the final gurgle of the pipes is one long frog croak. Wow. That's really good. Ribbit, ribbit. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. Um, Yeah, this has been great. Yeah. Cool. Uh, 20th, 20th anniversary, Magnolia. It's the 20th anniversary? This year. December, yeah. December. Look at that. Worked out. Look for our social media bullshit. Yeah, if you have anything that you... Follow us on hints, cover. Hipstagram. Mm-hmm. Hipstagram. Follow us on Hipstagram. Yeah. Uh, Tutor.com. Mm-hmm. Foursquare. Um, yep. Foursquare us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Foursquare us. Uh, Fault uh, book. You too beca- uh. can become the mayor of the Neil Postman podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We will. I'm, and I want to apologize again for uh, lying to you to get you here. But next time. Next time. Neil, all Neil You're here. We're doing all yeah. Neil Postman. Yep. So stay tuned for that. Everybody uh, read that book. Mm-hmm. Great. All right. All right. S- See stay. you later. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>